So we are building systems that are most efficient and fragile in the sense that in the past, people used to have suppliers to build an object and then progressively, they ended up having a single supplier in China, like 97% of that product would come from China. But what if there is a virus and a shutdown in that country? What happens to you? That's exactly what, what, what we saw. I'm pleased to bring to you this conversation with Scott Patterson, a Wall Street Journal reporter and author of the new book, Chaos Kings, How Wall Street Traders Make Billions in the New Age of Crisis. Scott is also the author of The Quants and Dark Pools. And on this special episode, we are joined by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who is the author of the Incerto Collection, which includes books like Fooled by Randomness, Skin in the Game, The Black Swan, among others. And Nassim is also the Distinguished Scientific Advisor at Universa Investments. Gentlemen, it is great to welcome you both on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Scott, since you are the author of the book, and that's largely what this conversation is about, and Nassim, I know you feature prominently in this book, let's start with you. What was it that drew you to this story? Uh, the idea for this story uh, was sort of born in the early days of 2020. And uh, we all remember what was happening then. <laughs> the uh, the pandemic uh, was creating all this chaos in the world and markets were crashing. Uh, we had riots in the street, um, political chaos uh, in America. And uh, two things happened that sort of came together that uh, created the idea for the book. One was that uh, when the market crashed, reports came out that Universa, the hedge fund that Nassim advises and is run by uh, his longtime colleague, Mark Spick Snail, had a 4,000 plus percent return in the first three months of the year, which was quite amazing when you know, this is a time when everybody else is is losing money, uh, is cratering, blowing up, and out comes this amazing return by Universal, uh, which is a fund that I've been tracking for a long time. I've known Mark and the scene since the uh, mid two thousands, um, and then I came upon a report that Nassim had written in early twenty twenty in January twenty twenty, uh, warning about COVID and how dangerous it was and the precautions that people needed to take uh, in order to uh, keep it from becoming a global systemic issue. And I kind of thought, you know, here in this, you know, January 2020 is not a time when most people were thinking that COVID was going to be what it became. But the scene was able to see it. Uh, and and it, it occurred to me that there's something about the, the thing, the way that Mark and the scene operate, the way that they see the world as, uh, you know, full of these extreme risks, black swans, as the uh, CMA famous, that uh, there, there's something going on here with these guys that's interesting and worth thinking about. Uh, what, you know, what is it about the two that enables them to enter these periods of, you know, extreme chaos and, you know, uh, come out looking pretty good. So I, you know, I proposed to Mark and the team uh, you know, writing a book about them, and uh, Nassim immediately said, "No way, uh, <laughs> I have no interest in doing that." Um, I said, "I said, I said, I said, you know, talk about the ideas, not the individuals." And what did he do? Talk about the individuals, right? <laughs> so you, he, he, he uh, did not. You did not. Uh, you promised that you'd be talking only, about the, mostly about the idea with some illustration, and it turned out you spoke about the individuals. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, you know, that's how I tell the stories. I, I tell them through uh, the stories of the people. Um, you see, I, 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 I do something else. Policy. Yeah, but Scott, in, in, in my, in my, in my books, uh, I, I illustrate my ideas from individuals, except that I create these individuals, like Fat Tony. Yeah. <laughs> see, whereas yeah. you have to go look for real individuals. It's, uh, it's too much work. Yeah, well, eventually the same came around, uh, and, and Mark, you know, agreed to talk to me a lot. So I spoke with Mark a lot, other people at Universa. Uh, Nassim eventually uh, buckled under and <laughs> talked to me a couple of times. Uh, we met, we had dinner in New York. Uh, it, was, it was it was fun writing the book. I don't recommend writing a book during a uh, global pandemic. 
Um, it, it complicates things a lot, especially when travel is, is difficult. But that's kind of where it, it you know, the, the idea uh, came from. And it's, you know, the, the subtitle is Wall Street Traders Make Billions. Um, that's part of the book. But really, the, the second part of the subtitle, The New Age of Crisis, um, is something I think people should focus on is that it's not just about making money in catastrophes. It's about trying to protect ourselves from catastrophes. And that's really where Nassim's ideas come in uh, with this paper that he wrote with several colleagues uh, in, uh, I think it was 2014 that came out, The Precautionary Principle. And that forms a big part of the narrative, too, is, is this paper about you know, how we should think about these big uh, global risks and what, how can you identify risks that require extreme precaution? Yeah, well, he certainly convinced you. Nassim, I learned a lot about you just reading this book and I got to say, I enjoy I, the people's I have, stories. Let me tell you one thing. I have actually, I'm confessing that I did not read the book because <laughs> I hate to read stuff written. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, one, I hate to read stuff written about myself, but also I have very little interest in my, I mean, I have interest in other things than myself. Okay, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I would say it, but effectively I did not. But I so I, but I know what's going on. But uh, I, but he's a better storyteller than I am. So I I, I may one day uh, you know uh, try to read it just to imitate his style. I I think you should read it. <laughs> I really do. Um, and I and personally I enjoyed learning. Um, because I didn't know I didn't, honestly didn't know that much about you or even Mark or like the relationship and how you all got together. Yep. Um, so maybe for folks who are watching and listening, it could be helpful because we are talking about um, the new age of crisis, trying to protect yourself from these big catastrophes. Maybe yes. for folks who aren't familiar with Universa, the work that you you and Mark Spitznagel and the team do there, um, the specialization in convex tail hedging. Can, can you frame up um, what you all do at Universa? Okay. I mean, I'm not gonna you know uh, focus too much on universa in this conversation as much as i will generalize so if you know people can uh, use uh, what we do as a special case rather than a general case but uh the, the in the black swan i and, and all the books but, but mostly in the black swan i explained that we have a problem with infrequent uh but large losses we have a problem with a mental problem with that. We we are good at doing it when we have skin in the game. When it's your family, uh, you don't take, you know, some classes of risk. But when you manage money for others, somehow uh, that precaution disappears. So we are uh, people, for example, in the investment business, like to have a steady income while sitting on a pile of dynamite. And, and because the incentive structure is not there, if, if the thing explodes, it's not their money. And, uh, and they, they, they anyway, it's, it's, it's more optimal for them because you make 10 bonuses and then you're fired and then you start again. So uh, it's just an apology letter when you blow up. Uh, you, the absence of skill in the game encourages these classes of payoff and finance. But in general, whenever you have bureaucrats, in society, it's the same problem because they want to look good. It's not their own thing. So uh, that, that, that can be generalized to society. It can be generalized to a lot of things. You buy, when you, 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 when you own, buy a house, you would not buy a house if you can't insure it because you don't want to take that tail risk. But if it's someone else says a house, uh, you know, you don't mind someone else's money. Then, then you say, oh, it's expensive. You find reasons to, to not spend that money. And uh, we know since Hammurabi's law, that society was built on trying to avoid these classes of risks and risk transfers because Hammurabi's law tells you that if the architect or the builder puts up a structure that collapses when, you know, you can't walk away from that risk, they can go and find you because you created risk for others. And therefore the architect may be put to death if people are killed by the, the collapse of the structure. So you can't really hide things in the corners. So we discovered, Mark and I, that there's, or actually we discovered uh, early on, uh, you know, when I started trading, that there is an incentive to have trades that make steady money and then explode. And decided, hey, you know what? I'm gonna take the other side. 
So that's how it started for me in finance. And then started generalizing to other things in society. And with a precautionary principle. Then I also noticed a couple of things that these tail events are getting deeper in, in, in you know, uh, socioeconomic systems and in biological systems because of connectivity. Like, for example, in the past, for the plague to travel from, say, uh, the Silk Road to Europe, uh, you know, it was traveling at a maximum speed of 30 uh, kilometers a day. And, 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 and there's some places in Northern Europe that were not reached for centuries. Whereas now with connectivity, something leaves Wuhan, assuming it started in Wuhan, leaves Wuhan, hits Milan in no time. And from Milan, guess what? The next weekend, you have a convention here, a convention there, and these conventions transmitted. So you, in three or four days, you've done centuries of work. It's the same thing in the socioeconomic system, Google effect. At no time in history have people start from college dorms, you know, uh, from the college dorm uh, type operation to dominate the world in, in no time. Okay. Well, that these tail events uh, are are getting deeper and 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 we what we have to do is try to figure out where we can be affected by them and where they are located they're located in biological systems like for pandemics and that was our uh, our work in like 2016 2017 when ebola started to tell people you're not understanding what's going on that these things can run out of control because of Air France, British Air, Delta Airlines, you know, that we didn't have in the past. So biological systems, you can have socioeconomic systems and also supply chain. Everything is more concentrated today. You see, you have a shortage, it's going to be a worldwide shortage, but also the system is overreactive. Then you have gluts after that, you see. So, so we live in an environment that uh, we must understand and uh, and and once you have an idea what's going on, that globalization is an excellent thing, but it comes with side effects. That travel is an excellent thing, but it comes with some uh, hidden, very hidden uh, drawbacks. So uh, once you understand the world, then you can live a better life, and that's sort of like we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, once you understand uh, that risk too, and I think a lot of it probably comes down to like, not, when I think of investing, um, surviving to fight another day, I imagine. Exactly, that's another, this. that's a big idea for us is that, uh, you know, someone like Warren Buffett experienced people, they know it, they understand that you don't look at uh, a payoff, uh, using uh, a payoff of any security when, when you are threatened, he says, in order to thrive, you must first survive. People think that it's an option, you see? It's like, uh, uh, so you can't play Russian roulette because eventually you're gonna be dead. So no matter what the payoff is, you're gonna be dead. You keep repeating, do it repeatedly. So so Mark wrote a bunch of books on it and, uh, and, and we embedded that in the precaution principle is that there's an absorbing barrier. If you, don't, if you hit your absorbing barrier, you're gone. So a lot of, the, a lot of trades that look very attractive, mm -hmm. very, very attractive, okay? Will 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 make you blow up simply because you're guaranteed over the long run to hit the absorbing barrier, which, which is why you must have some kind of protection from the absorption. A tailor is hedging for universa or other things in your own life. So naively, uh, uh, if you if I accept a bet that's fifty one percent my favor, forty nine percent against me. People think, hey, you know what? It's uh, you have an edge. No, because if you play it repeatedly, you know, with with large amounts, you odds are you're gonna blow up. No matter, you know, no matter uh, in the long run, it's gonna happen. So you must. There are uh, techniques to do, and and also we must change the mind of people. We tell them life is dynamic; it's not static. So a lot of these analysis are static. So if you have tiny risk of, uh, of uh, blow up, you will blow up in the long run. And then one example I give is, uh, is uh, you know, pilots. If, if the plane has very low probability of crashing, you would have no experienced pilots because eventually you would become 100% on the repetition. And, and that's sort of the guiding principle behind both Universa, the precautionary principle, 
principle that uh, that we call it non-naive precautionary principle and and other things yeah um i want to bring up an anecdote from the book um and and maybe scott you can you can share more here but um he told a story about you nasim when you were a young man at the Merck, and it was a story about a, a trader and, and someone said hey like hey kiddo uh, see that guy over there his name is ed he made seven million dollars in seven years and you said yes and then that person said to you he lost it all in seven seconds now you can go and I imagine that was probably um a very impressionable moment too because it, it's like you were saying earlier sitting on dynamite a lot of folks are sitting on dynamite uh -huh. um scott i would love to get you to jump in here too with some of these anecdotes of these guys um because it sounds like not only did Nassim learn this early on um mark spitznagel learned this early on this kind of realization too of like i think maybe it's probably a bit of a flaw with modern finances people probably think you know steady gain steady gain, exactly, steady gain. Exactly. can i can i run in here to continue the idea to make it clearer for the sake of clarity and uh and uh, scott i give you you know i trade the time with you for later so the 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 whole thing is is very simple. Let's say, can I lose weight in a day? Can I gain a lot of weight in a day? No, because I consume about eight hundred thousand calories a year. Not a single day is going to make a difference. Plus two thousand calories, minus two thousand calories, it's not going to make a difference. So I'm not going to lose ten percent of my weight in a day, but I can lose hundred percent of my money in a second. So we're talking about two processes that are completely different. And these processes, what I call extreme stand, generate fat tails. And finance is one of them. And the tools used in finance, uh, Marco was just passed today. Uh, you know, it's uh, he was a great person, and, and he did not intend to have generalization of his work uh, done in such a manner. But modern finance is based on what I call mediocre stand on the bell curve that completely underestimates the effect of these things. Like, for, like, as I said, it's calories you consume every day, they follow a bell curve. But the PL of a company or PL of a trader does not follow a bell curve. The distribution of, of, of viruses does not follow a bell curve. So we're talking about different processes. And once you exit that uh, classical finance framework, uh, the, the very little has been done. Sorry, sorry, Scott, I interrupted. Yeah, well, I mean, this is another anecdote from the book. Uh, is Mark learning how to trade at the Chicago Board of Trade. And uh, he's taught by a veteran commodity trader that he needs to, uh, you know, what he called love to lose, which is not the way most traders think. Uh, most traders think I'd love to win, I love to gain. So Mark learned really early on that you have to do something that's sort of unnatural, that you have to cut your losing positions very quickly in order to avoid the, the big tail risk. Um, and that's something that, you know, that mentality, he brought that to uh, uh, Empirica, the hedge fund that Nassim and, and Mark founded in 1999, which is kind of like, you know, when you're buying these options that only pay off in extreme events, you're losing money every day, which can be very painful, uh, as Nassim knows. You know, when you're uh, you're just sitting there, you're, you're p l keeps going down. Uh, that is exa the exact opposite of how most of Wall Street works, which is you want to see your p l go up a little bit every day. But there's that hidden risk that Nassim is talking about, that powder keg is going to blow up. And that's really what Nassim and Mark discovered, is that's really what you need to think about more than anything else, is the big downturn, the big 50% or 100% loss that, that blows you up. Think about that more than anything, and then you'll be okay. You'll, yeah, as you said, live to you know trade another day. Yeah, um, I I want to explore too uh, just a bit more um, because I'm thinking about that extreme downside, but also like the fragilities in the system. And um, Nassim, maybe you can frame it up here. Of it seems like maybe we're getting increasingly more fragile. Um, what are the big risk or the fragilities that you see? Maybe if we could zoom out more of the big picture macro environment that we're in yeah. today. So uh, let me start with a simple metaphor, generalizable, and we go from there. Uh, can you have an accident walking that would kill the person uh, uh, that you hit? No, at, at, at small speed. 
it's not going to happen. So, but the faster you drive, the more likely you know, I mean, the, the accident rate increases, but also the impact of the accident increases. So you have efficiencies when you drive, but if you drive at 30 miles per hour, then you'll be okay. But if you drive at uh, 500 miles per hour, odds are you're never going to get there. So this is what we call pseudo efficiencies. So if you, at some point, the, 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 the fragile, because of fragility, the, the efficiency is no longer there. So we are building systems that are both efficient and fragile in the sense that in the past, people used to have suppliers, uh, local suppliers, a lot of them, uh, to build an object. And then progressively, they ended up having a single supplier in China, like 97% of that product would come from China, which is very nice because you save a lot of money, so you think it's efficient. But what if there is a virus? <laughs> and a shutdown in that country, what happens to you? That's exactly what, what, what we saw. So we have much, much more uh, of a dependence. The system is no longer as diversified as it was. It's much more reactive. And the supply chain has uh, weak points. And, and just like these weak points can, can, can slow down the entire, uh, an entire economy. So what you, we must do, and effectively this has been done since COVID, COVID effectively, improve the supply chain because people figure out their uh, weak points and figure out how to diversify around it, pick suppliers in a different continent, even if it's more money. You see, in a, in a, in a, we had in a, in a, in a, since 19, say 95, we've had accountants run the show, not risk managers and not real engineers. Engineers like redundancies. Accountants like, just look at the bottom line, not realizing what what got us there and accountants kept pushing I and mean, i talked to people when i talked to people in the industry said so exactly this is the accountant sometimes when the ceo is an accountant you know the company is going to blow up because they want to cut costs a little beyond what's necessary and they don't know where to cut so our system had a fragile supply chain and we saw it and now it's going to get a lot better because we learned from the COVID episode how to improve that, uh, that uh, make it more robust. However, we have hidden risks elsewhere, and these are financial. It's the same risk as Scott was mentioning, the people who like to make money or, or hide risk in a tail because it's pleasant you know, to appear to be doing well. The Federal Reserve did the same thing. Lowering interest rates to zero in a panic was a very uh, cosmetic uh, move that relieved the pain short term, but hid a huge amount of risk that kept building up over time. In valuation, say real estate, in valuation of many things that, that in the, exploded, a hundred and some trillion from real estate and, and, and more elsewhere. And, and you have entire industries that were based on the old Warren Buffett discounted cash flow. Here, you know, we can tolerate a few uh, negative quarters, maybe even a few negative years, but eventually we're shooting for cash flow. And now they're building all these VC funds that are shooting for what? Not cash flow, for valuation. And that's what we're going to sell up to someone else. So that is where uh, our environment now is has built up risk coming from the reaction to the 2008 crisis. I want to bring up two with you while I have you as well, because <laughs> this is something that came up multiple times in the book. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions around a black swan and what is a black swan? I know there are also gray swans. Um, could you could you clarify that for the folks? Okay, so let me let me explain the first thing that, that um, I can detect if a person has problems if they ask for a precise definition, like physicists, when we talk to them uh, about a black swan, they say, I need a precise definition of a black swan. And these I know will have problems in real life because they lack that, 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 that notion of called theory of mind and understanding that a black swan depends on the observer. So, so let, let's say that September 11 was a black swan that is an unexpected, completely unexpected 
uh, tail event with large consequences. It's completely unexpected for me. It was unexpected for you. Maybe Scott, uh, you know, knew something. <laughs> but for the person on a plane, it was not unexpected. So th that's uh, what I call the turkey problem. You see, the, the turkey is going to have a surprise on Thanksgiving minus a few days, but the butcher will not have a surprise. So the whole idea is you have butchers and turkeys in life. So for me, a black swan, it depends on the observer. And you can solve the problem by knowing a little more, one. And two, by more intelligently, but not trying to predict it, but trying to figure out how robust you are for these classes of events. To give a very simple example of robustness. If I have cash in a bank, I don't have to predict the environment. I don't need to know what will cause a crisis. I don't have to, you know, be hemmed to my computer screen, which anyway won't help. I got reserve, and I'm robust. I got cash in the bank or cash under the mattress or gold or something, you know, in in, uh, in, a, in a vault. You know, so I, I, I'm okay. I don't have to predict the environment. But if you have debt, you're going to be nervous. You're going to need to predict. The environment. So there's a difference between the robust and the person who is fragile, hence much more dependent on the environment and on absence of black swan. <laughs> so it, it's it's a, it's the same for portfolio for a lot of things. We don't need to understand why the market can crash. If you're protected, you're protected. So you don't have to read the papers, try to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, be have them to the media. And this I understood early on. When in 1985, a, uh, a fellow, I was working, I would not name the bank because this was, there was a fellow who read every single, he stacked every single newspaper. The Times, Financial Times, everything. And then the magazines, they read everything, so they wanted to know what's going on. At the time, we, you know, we didn't have the, the, the internet. And someone pointed out to him and said, the, guy, the people who make money, they have no idea. They don't read the papers. And when they read the papers, they read the New York Post, which basically they get some New York City gossip or New York area gossip. So I realized in 1985, I said, you know what? I'm going to go with the, with, the, with the people who read the New York Post. So not try to predict the environment, but that's left, or, or try to understand how to hedge yourself better or how to maneuver with it a lot better. And that saved me. And then later on, I realized that effectively there's no predictability to reading the paper. But I got that early on. It saved me a lot of time that I spent reading other stuff. So the key here is if you need to understand the environment, then you're already in trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a lesson that Mark also learned early on with the, the commodity trader uh, at the CBOT, he said he got obsessed with trying to track corn prices and he'd actually like go look at corn fields and see what try to figure out what the yield was. And he'd come to the trader and he'd say, you know, look at look at the, you know, uh, farm production data, and, you know, all this other stuff. And the trader would say, it's bullshit. Nobody can predict the prices. You have to be robust to the downside cut your losses, and then you'll survive. And it's, it's really interesting how these two different ways of looking at the market, that, you know, Mark and Nassim came together and sort of formed this, you know, they, they learned things differently at different places, but they had, they kind of developed the same strategy that allowed them to uh, survive during crashes and black swans. So in, in, in anti-fragile, I explained that if you're convex and other you have more upside than downside, if you have optionality, you you don't need you can be completely dumb and and outperform an IQ of a thousand. And I explained, I showed it even mathematically that if you just systematically do trial and error, which is like an option, where where your losses are small if you're wrong, and your gains are large if you're correct. In the long run, you're going to outperform anything. And actually, I applied it and looked at it and said, I showed this is how pharma developed. It's all because they're convex. In other words, they have small downside. 
from their er errors. And, and usually a lot of successful uh, drugs are errors because of the side effects of other drugs. Like you look for uh, for a blood pressure drug and you make a mistake and it turns out to be Viagra. <laughs> So you have upside from your mistakes. So, but I mean, you want, it's, it's, it's sufficient to have optionality. Yeah. And long run, so long as you don't pay a lot for it. Um, now, now the okay. second point is to to show that you're not really paying too much for optionality. Yeah. Let me ask you, I know you, you probably have to go out. I don't want to get one more question in for you, Nassim. Yeah. Um, because you're talking about like small little losses and then you have explosive upside, um, the convexity there. I'm curious because there are copycats or they try to copy you guys and your strategy that y'all pioneered. What is it that separates you all? There's, I imagine it's got to do with the psychology too, to be able to stomach the little losses. So this is, this is uh, central. Uh, as I, as we say, God is in the details. You see between a naive strategy and a uh, sophisticated one, you have 25 years of experience. And it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, experience to, you know, to execute these trades. Because if you pay up a little bit, and then again, uh, you know, you do it repeatedly, you, you got out, of, you become out of business. So you have to know what to buy. So we develop experience. And in the beginning, of course, uh, we were new to the business, and uh, and of course you. Uh, don't do very well in the beginning and, and I mean, you do better than others maybe because everybody's new but uh, progressively you get better better and better better at calibrating your, your thing so it's experience and, and execution you see we, we, we you know you look at lecture that we have you do put mathematics on the board and start buying options the, the, some of it but it's mostly pit trading I mean Mark was a pit trader <laughs> So working the orders is, is, is central. Okay, there is one thing I want to bring up with you because in the book and, and after you leave, I'll get Scott to delve into this. Um, there are kind of like these two tensions or two different battlegrounds. So you have um, Black Swan, Black Swan theorist. Um, and then there's also the introduction in the book from of Sornet's uh, Dragon oh, okay. Kings, which are, that they yeah. can be predicted. I want to get your take on Black Swans I, I would, versus okay, Dragon I'm gonna, Kings. I'm going to be very, very uh, brief. I was very uh, nice to Sornet when we had that debate, and he was surprised, and uh, I represented this point. But um, how can I explain? Um, the debate is in the book, by the way. Sorry? The the debate debate. Book, yes, but I would I would say that Sornet is a very smart person, but I think his uh, contact with reality is a little has, a, has he needs to improve on that a little more. You see, but he he doesn't realize that uh, his, his theories don't sort of like fit reality very well. Why not? I didn't say that publicly, but I'm going to say it now. All right. Do you want to elaborate? Um, there's a difference between his theories and the real world. Burnett is trying to do something that's very, very difficult, if not impossible. He's claiming that he can predict a bubble. And no. what I found looking at various examples of, of uh, instances and predictions from his financial crisis observatory uh, is that he did have some success identifying assets, commodities that were entering bubbles. And then he would make a call and say, this thing's in a bubble. And then it, it might go down a little bit, but then it, it could go up another 100%. So it, he, it's very hard to predict when something's going to pop. Um, exactly. If, if, if Sarnet, Sarnet had a PNL, uh, we'd know a lot more about uh, the invalidity of his methods. You see, it's practically uh, every time we, every everyone knows that there's a bubble. Everyone knows it's a bubble. So yeah. the, the thing yeah. is, our, our idea is it's a bubble. Stay away from it, and let's do something else with our lives. Uh, so Ned says, "Oh, I'm going to predict when it's going to pop." But I I I prefer to not comment on his ability to predict uh, bubbles popping up. Yeah, I suppose. Like, I I just maybe uh, it's uh, uh, sorry, uh, bubbles imploding. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you buy that anybody can make 
predictions with accuracy in finance? Um, just, I mean, it's just more of a curiosity. I, I, I have an expression. I've, 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 a lot of people are very good uh, predictors. Uh, and these are usually the ones who go bust. And uh, I've, I've explained it that predicting an event is one thing and benefiting from, from it is another thing. See, I'm a very bright predictor. I'm wrong most of the time, but it doesn't cost me much to be wrong. That's what matters. It's the payoff, not the frequency of oh being God. correct. Oh, I like that. It doesn't yes. cost much to be wrong. Well, Nassim, uh, oh, I'd say thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I really appreciate you coming on. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Scott, for these nice comments. And Julia, again, uh, you're... you're uh, I don't do podcasts, but I, I've done two with you, and I'm sure I'm going to do a third one uh, sometime soon. I appreciate it. I got to say, I always think of you when I deadlift or if I see squid ink pasta on the menu. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank All you right. very much. Thanks a lot. Bye, Nassim. Thanks. Take care. Bye now. God, we will con we'll continue this conversation. Um, so I want to, okay, maybe it'll be helpful for the folks. Uh, on that, the last couple of questions, when I brought up these two kind of factions, the Black Swans versus the Dragon Kings, and there's kind of like a bit of a tent, at least that was my takeaway. There's almost a little bit of a tension in the book between these two, um, I guess, theories, if you will. Could you frame it up for the folks who are um, watching and listening? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wanted to get Didier Sornet in the book, not so much to say, here's something that people should emulate or hear something that's a successful strategy, but it's to sort of put what Universa does in context in terms of risk management. And this debate that Nassim and Didier had in New York, uh, I think it was mid-2015 you know, or something like that. Uh, the it's, it's really interesting because the two different ways of looking at the market uh, clash, and it's almost like they're talking past one another. But this, what Nassim says that is a, is a very good point is that making these predictions is interesting if you're a trader and, and maybe it works sometimes, but it's not the appropriate way to think about risk management. And, and that's what people miss is that if you're a fund and you have client assets and you want to protect it, making these you know sort of wild guesses on bubbles is not going to work out very well for your clients. You need to think about what your your positions are, uh, what your risk is, what your exposure is to extreme events. And that's the way to uh, manage risk more effectively than trying to be a trader and make predictions, which, you know, I mean, I'm not, I don't trade, I can't trade as a Wall Street Journal reporter uh, at all. Um, but I don't, you know, I wouldn't want to, and I, I think that you know the record is littered with uh, failed traders um, especially the, I, I'm sort of horrified by the concept of day trading yeah um, now I know you know sometimes people are successful but over the long run it's probably uh, you, you know most people aren't gonna it's not gonna work out very well for them predicting is just so hard uh, you know but it's it's so interesting that you know what universe does, is it allows you to not predict, at least not in you know specific stocks. What you're basically doing is you're predicting that the stock market is going to do pretty well over the long run. And when there's these extreme events that knock the market down 30, 40 percent, you're going to do well in that period. You might even get an infusion of cash that you can use to buy the market when it's you know knocked down. Um, but over time, you're gonna you're gonna do pretty well, but you don't have to make these strategic bets. Yeah, I always thought of it kind of like a, just like insurance policy, if you if you will, like that, like um. Yeah, totally. Insurance. Yeah, let me ask you this because um, Universa has gotten so much attention, of, and especially in recent years. And I, I've I've interviewed uh, Mark before, and um, it was in I okay, it was the end of March of 2020 where the Universa's Black Swan Protection Protocol Fund. It gained in that three-month period um, more than 4,000%. I remember those headlines. And then in the 15 years, they've posted an average annual return on capital of over 100%. And that's according to audited returns. And I, and I think you reported that. 
you reported that in the Wall Street Journal. Um, I guess on the question when I asked Nassim earlier, um, there are some copycats out there. Um, what I mean, maybe for, I don't know if you have a take on this, but why do you think that um, others haven't been quite able to replicate what they've achieved? Uh, it's, you know, I think what Nassim said was probably the best explanation is that they've been doing this for 25 years and you learn a lot uh, about the market dynamics and where to go strategically to make your trades uh you became you, you become a known entity to uh firms that are looking to enter to be a counterparty to these trades so they they have relationships on wall street that they've developed um that allow them to get better deals i think you know but i did talk to other tail hedge funds and it's a it's a pretty uh, catty world. <laughs> yeah, funds, yeah. Like seen that all, on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, they. I mean, they like to snipe at one another and say, "Oh, those returns." Are, you know, there's some controversy around how Universal reports its returns. You know, I say, well, you know, they invented this thing. You know, so they can report their returns however they want. <laughs> you know, they're not coming in and and copying the strategy and saying trying to act like a more traditional hedge fund. So their returns are legitimate. You, you know, people try to say they're not, they are. They are. Um, I, I think that uh, there, you know, it, it comes down to entering the trades most cost effectively, I think. That's, you know, to, to survive during the fallow periods where the market is, is going up. Um, knowing when to trade, they have uh, signals that say, okay, now's a good time to buy. They have signals that say, now we got to cash in. Um, and so it's not, uh, it's not like an algorithm that it's all autom automated, but they do have things like that, that, you know, it, according to my conversations with them, give them signals based on their historical record. Yeah. Well, now that Nassim's not here, let's talk about him. Um, because my guess is he's not going to watch or listen to the podcast since he confessed that he ha he has not read the book. I actually I read your book actually, and um, I'm amazed too that you know, okay, he didn't want to participate and then he did, and I learned a lot about him, like maybe some more personal things I didn't know, and um, also maybe a lot of folks follow him on Twitter, and he's kind of known for his, you know slinging some insults on Twitter, although I haven't, I haven't been subjected to those and I have not been blocked. I'm actually followed. Um, but gosh, was there anything that you learned in the process? You've known Nassim for 15 years, maybe more than that. I might be wrong. Maybe you've known him since the Empirica days. Is there anything that surprised you in this process of reporting the book about Nassim or anything that like maybe folks miss about him or they don't quite know about him that you got to learn? Um, he, I mean, he's a, he comes off a lot of he's a very divisive person right and uh when he doesn't like what you're doing or saying he will tell you that uh i think it um it, it, that turns off a lot of people you know and he can he calls people names uh i know that's something that mark is not a fan of he kind of feels embarrassed sometimes when mark gets in these twitter spats like one i recount in the book with uh cliff asness of aqr mm -hmm. where they get in this fight over aqr's returns and nasim is saying he doesn't understand the strat the strategy taylor's strategy um and i think nasim probably has a good point um just when you look at the, the success of universal over the long run um but you know i've never had a problem with this I, I think he's a he's a personable guy when you get to know him and if he likes you uh, he's fun to be around. I've had, you know, gone out to dinner with him, had drinks with him. Um, and I think that, you know, early on when I first got to know him in 2007, uh, I was a big fan of Fooled by Randomness. I was, at the time I was covering hedge funds, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And it was sort of like this underground, uh, book that hedge fund managers loved and, you know, even though it's said that they're most of them are, uh, you know, the ones who are fools, but they wait. Was that the full? Wait, you said fooled by random randomness. Was that the book? Yeah, fooled by okay, randomness. Yeah, yeah. Which is so. This is pre Black Swan, mm -hmm. um, and I it, I really liked the book. It was it, uh, 
you know, I come from a liberal arts background. I studied English in college, you know, so when I got out of college, I could tell you a lot about 18th century English novels, you know, or postmodern American novels, nothing about the market. Um, but then I, I moved to New York and I started, you know, working in finance and I came across these economic theories about how markets are supposed to be efficient based on rational expectations, uh, you know, which all seem to me kind of crazy because, you know, when you're reading a bunch of novels, you, you sort of, you know, studying psychology, people do not seem rational. <laughs> they, they seem very irrational. Uh, especially when it comes to money, you know, so this idea that people are acting, acting rationally with their money was very counterintuitive to me. I think the market's driven by greed and fear, not rationality. And the, and when you read Nassim's books, you know, he, he comes at things from that perspective. Like, you know, this idea that things are always rationally priced is baloney. Because things just get completely crazy. And that, you know, that's what a black swan is, is when fear just pervades the market and, you know, everybody rushes for the exits at the same time and it crashes. Um, so, you know, when I got to know him, I kind of I had this uh, worldview that kind of meshed with his, but from a different perspective. So we kind of, you know, were able to see eye to eye on a lot of things about, you know, how the market works. Yeah, I like that. Um, I guess going back to the book too, like, um, how do you see some of the ideas presented in the book? How do you how do you see those possibly influencing, um, you know, maybe how individuals or maybe you could say organizations how they might invest in the future? Do you see any of these ideas like having some impact or maybe even having folks kind of rethink how they invest? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that. You know, talking to Mark and other people at Universa, they uh, just continually encounter an inability to understand the strategy um, by, you know, pension fund managers, just, you know, many people in the financial world. They've struggled with that throughout uh, their history. In fact, I, I talk about how the first year after they launched, they didn't, you know, and this is 2007 and 2008 when there was a lot of volatility. They didn't get a single investor uh, for, you know, almost 12 months. They wow. traveled all over America. They went to Europe. Nobody would buy it because it's a it's a very counterintuitive strategy. And it doesn't look good on, you know, P&L because you're losing a lot. It looks like a line item. And, you know, uh, it doesn't fit within modern portfolio theory, which uh, likes very low volatility strategies. This is a very volatile <laughs> You can't get more volatile than a universal strategy. Um, so I don't know. I, I, you know, would hope that maybe some people out there read the book, which presents the ideas in a straightforward uh, manner. Um, anybody can understand it. It's not, you know, it's not really that complicated. Um, and I, you know, I think maybe, you know, they don't have to invest with Universa. There's a lot of these other funds out there, but it could. I, I think it could help. Um, you know, especially pension funds, they've been sort of locked in uh, tunnel vision of the 60-40 strategy, which is 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And with Universa, what they say is it's the ideal mix is to have just 3% in a Universa crash strategy, black swan strategy, and then the rest in the market. And that gives you a lot more upside exposure to stocks, which generally go up, you know, uh, over time, you're protected from the crashes. And that's what really matters. And uh, it does well. And Mark has run all these scenarios uh, with various mixes of assets over the years and has shown, he's written about this in Barron's in his own letters to investors, that the universe of strategy tends to overperform uh, over time. Yeah, over time too. Um I want to go back to something at the very beginning of the conversation too, because just kind of mentioning even the the title, the subtitle of the book, if you will, um, how Wall Street traders make billions in the new age of crisis. And we didn't really get to explore this as much. I, I, I mean, I kind of asked Nassim, but I want to hear this notion of the new age of crisis. Like, what does that mean to you, or what did you, what does that mean in your own process of writing the book? 
Yeah. Well, I, you know, like I said at the start of the interview, it was born in the, in the crazy days of uh, 2020. And, you know, anybody, I think I, things have gotten a little bit more calm since then. But looking around, it felt sort of like things were unraveling in all sorts of different places. And that maybe there's something going on here that's just not that confluence of a bunch of extreme events, but extreme events exacerbating one another at the same time and making the, making the whole worse than the sum of parts. Um, and so there was this feeling of unraveling. Uh, we had extreme chaos in the political sphere in the US with uh, polarization. Um, I actually, I covered the January 6th hearings for the journal last year. So I, I had a lot of exposure to, to what went on there. Um, another thing I write about a lot in the book, which is, which dovetails with what I do normally at the journal, which is cover climate and, uh, global warming. And this is something that, uh, is systemic. It's getting worse. It's creating fragilities and all these different places. And this is a, you know, a big risk financially. And I get into, you know, how the insurance companies are looking at uh, climate as something that's become black swan like, uh, unpredictable, extreme, uh, huge risk. We've just seen that recently with insurance companies pulling out of California and Florida. Um, so these things magnify on one another. Uh, they create social upheaval. Um, climate creates, uh, you know, causes uh, populations to shift. Um, so you have that. And also what Nassim was talking about with travel. Uh, this is um, what one of his uh, cohorts on the paper, the precautionary principle, uh, has written extensively about this complexity theorist named Ginir Baryam. Uh, he wrote a paper called Transition to Extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, title I find kind of terrifying. <laughs> I, I use it as a chapter title. And the idea is, and he's looking at this mathematically, uh, when you had extremely deadly uh, pathogens break out, say in, in a village in Africa, uh, it's so deadly that it just kills its host very rapidly and doesn't spread, at least not much, and you know, slow enough to, to be able to catch it like Ebola. Um, but with transportation, rising so dramatically not just through planes but you know people riding on buses cars uh the risk of those pathogens breaking out and spreading to a much wider population is rising uh very rapidly and you know this is uh, obviously what we saw with covid um as the scene mentioned is it it's riding on airplanes across the ocean uh from people that attended conferences together or uh, the Milan Fashion Week uh, in uh, early 2020. Um, <clears throat> so there, you know, it's a bunch of different things. We have, you know, increased complexity in technology, and, and it's magnifying itself. So AI, you know, everybody's talking about AI now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that um, some experts think could could accelerate very very rapidly as AI uh, creates itself. And become so complex that its creators don't understand how it works. And I think we're, you know, according to some of my reading about uh, AI researchers uh, and programmers, is we're kind of already at that point where the way these systems work uh, is so complicated, and what's going on inside the black box um, is has uh, sort of jumped beyond the capacity of its own creators to understand. And that is you know kind of worrisome i mean i i i haven't i don't know enough about ai to say okay these you know forecasts of doom are legitimate uh, you know some people think they're not some people think that ai is going to be this wonderful thing that you know leads us into a beautiful new world <laughs> um but it's you know it's all these things happening at once um as humanity gets you know more people live on the world uh we're we're experiencing a new age of crisis i think where yeah. the extreme events happen uh more often um and 
we need to get a grip on that and and realize it and try to figure out ways that we can uh, take precautions against the worst event, worst uh, outcomes. Yeah, I think that's a a good way to conclude. I do want to give you a few moments, Scott, if you want to let folks know where they can find you on social media. Obviously, go pick up the book, everyone. Um, and if you have any parting thoughts, anything that we didn't bring up that you would like people to know, um, please take a moment to do so. Uh, yeah, you can find me uh, at Patterson Scott on Twitter. Uh, I have a website, scottpattersonbooks.com. Um, and it, as far as, you know, I guess uh, final thoughts is it's, I've, I've thought, I found some of the Amazon reviews of the book to be kind of interesting because they, uh, I'm getting um, attacked as being too political, <laughs> which I find kind of funny because the book is not about politics, but there is this, uh, you know, I mentioned polarization, this view that uh, taking climate risk seriously is a political uh, standpoint. Unfortunately, there's, you know, it, it has become a political issue. But to me, it's about science and the science of climate change is uh, settled. <laughs> you know, this is a real thing that's happening. And uh, billion, it's a it's a money story, too, because billions and billions of dollars are going into the technologies that are going to help us get out of this mess. So we covered at the Wall Street Journal as a as a finance story, not a political story, as a science story. Um, I you know so I, I just I think that uh, it's unfortunate that that issue is uh, has been, become politicized, as has you know COVID and the response to COVID and that vaccines. So that, I mean this is another risk that we have where uh we're you know some percent of the population is unable to uh actually see what risks we're facing because they've been politicized because there's disinformation um and that i think that's that's another one of the you know looming risks out there that we, have, that we, we are doing well scott patterson author of chaos kings how wall street traders make billions in the new age of crisis i thank you so much for being so generous with your time really appreciate you coming on the show and of course to nasim taleb who was on just moments ago i also appreciate his time thank you both so much thank you julie it was great